So, uh, we start with our first lecture and uh, corresponding the first module. So, previously we have seen a small summary uh, course introduction. Now, we go with the lecture wise and module wise. So, the first module is the introduction to process development and uh, in the first lecture what we will see is the important steps for process development. So, what we will uh, cover in this particular lecture is the introduction to chemical production technology principle. So, why I have chose the word production instead of process because uh, we are using a process to produce some things like as a chemical engineer what we are doing is we are converting uh, raw material to some useful form or value added form. So, it is something which is always production which is going on. So, the process is a part of the production. Then uh, we will see what are the levels of integration. So, levels of integration uh, what we will discuss is primarily the integration means whether it is the uh, time and the length scale we are referring to. So, the time scale and length scale is very important because whether the particular reaction or any process is going in a nano regime or it is going in a macro regime or a meso regime or the actual plant that is we will discuss. Then the chemical process structure, what do you mean by chemical process structure? It means uh, you have some raw material, you want to do some methods so as to you cannot use directly the raw material in a process you need to do some pre-treatment activities before you start the process. So, based on that then you apply some unit operation whether it is reaction, whether it is distillation, extraction, crystallization then you separate out the product. So, these are all a part of chemical process structure. Then finally, we will uh, give a short uh, summary of the modules because from this particular lecture does not talk about the or it has no relation with the modules. The ensuing modules or the ensuing lectures. I will talk this briefly about the although we have seen some of these modules in the introduction, we will discuss a bit briefly or a bit expand on these modules. So, what are the chemical process technology principles? So, this is an important aspect the scale independent. So, now these different areas the chemistry, the biology, physics, mathematics, thermodynamics, physical transport phenomena. So, this does not depend upon scale ok. So, scale means when I talk about scale whether it is length scale or size it does not depend upon. I mean we do not know like for a let us say we are extraction you want to extract a solute from its solution. So, you will only be able to tell you ok this is the solvent I will use to extracting this solute. You will not be telling that how much time it will be required for the solute to be extracted or how big a column should be or extraction column or how many stages it should have or what is the different geometry of the distillation column like that. So, this is the basic of any process engineering. So, we do a this is called we can say micro level. So, micro level means we talk about the chemistry of the system the biology for biological reactions we need to know the biological processes and uh, because the one thing to remember the chemical reactions and biological reactions do differ in the way we find out the kinetics. So, they may be you know the unit to form the equations separately. So, that is why they are independent then physics of the problem then the mathematics. So, if there are a number of variables and you need to solve those through equations then thermodynamics well thermodynamics also an important aspect because thermodynamics there are some processes where thermodynamics actually will tell us the thermodynamic extent of conversion. For example, in the case of reaction A to B goes to C. So, we will be able to tell thermodynamically how much conversion is possible based on their Gibbs energy, but this is thermodynamically. If the reaction is reaction controlled then uh, the thermodynamic level of conversion would not do. So, then we have to look up the rate kinetics that way. Then the physical transport phenomena means whether it is diffusing or it is diffusing fast, slow, slow reaction, fast reactions like that. Then uh, micro and nano level kinetics. Now, when we talk about micro and nano level kinetics it means we are uh, going into the molecule level, molecular level means talking about the atoms, the bonds ok the bond formation or the dissociation energies 
bond lengths. We are talking about those things. So, catalysis on a molecular level interface chemistry. So, it means that if there is a catalytic reaction happening, what are those active sites of a particular catalyst molecule? Now, it is a particular catalyst molecule. We are not talking of the continuum as a whole. For a particular catalyst particle, where are the active sites? And if there are the active sites, how many pro volume it can process? All those comes under the interfacial chemistry. Then microbiology, okay, we are chemical engineers, we are now doing lot of biological applications. This microbiology is also uh, based on the delivery of some enzymatic reactions or it may be based on some proteins. Suppose you want to find out the molecular weight of a protein, how to do that, all those things comes in the particle technology. Similar to that, particle technology, the motion of the particles, but these are all studied at the nano level or micro level. We are not studying whether it will be in the bulk how it will behave. We cannot tell that, it is only till the nano level. Then meso level, now meso level is something where uh, earlier chemical engineering used to do this, the reactor technology unit operation, you have studied this in chemical reaction engineering and mass transfer operations 1 and 2. What it is, it means that the reactor technology, you apply your concepts of chemical engineering, let us suppose you want to find out the reactor volume. So, then uh, you have to pick which reactor, whether plug flow, CSTR, batch reactor and how will you pick that? You will pick that based upon the reaction. So, whether there is any, we want to separate out the reactants and products or you want high throughput like that or what is the space time or what is the, is it is exothermic, endothermic, all these things you have to consider. Then you design the reactor. When you design the reactor, you talk about the reactor volume that is to be minimized, reactor volume, the selectivity should be maximized. But there is a trade-off, you cannot have both of them together. So, these are all coming under mesoscale. Unit operation is, uh, you know, there are different unit operations we have studied, the diffusion, then distillation, extraction, okay. These are absorption, these are all unit operation because this will be a part of any chemical process. You want to, whether you want to separate out a component, you will have extraction, but after you extract there will be two phases. One of them will be the solute rich phases, but then there will be another solvent rich phases. So, we do you throw out the solvent? No. So, what you will do? You will take out the clean solvent, then again recycle it because you do not want to throw out because it has to be a closed loop. You will again and again keep on using the same solvent for several cycles. These are called unit operations. Now, macro level process technology and process development. This is where uh, chemical engineers contribute the most. The process integration and design means what? Suppose you have two reactions happening, one is exothermic, one is endothermic. So, it means the heat release in all the reaction can be taken up by the reaction which is endothermic. So, you have to integrate so that your requirement of utilities is less, the hot utilities, cold utilities are the least. So, that is what is called process integration and design. So, design means when I talk of the design or process development, it means that you have number of unit operation and you want to place them sequentially, parallel or how you want to place it. Do you want to place a bigger reactor first, smaller reactor later on and then you separate out the phases and whether you want a once through process or a recycled base process, closed loop process, all this you actually apply your concepts of chemical engineering. This you usually do in the case of chemical engineering, we have packages such as Aspen, ChemCAD, HiSys, they help you a lot because for one or two component you can do it by hand, but for number of components where it becomes in practically impossible to solve those equations simultaneously, you take help of these softwares. Then process control and operation is also important. Process control means uh, if the systems there should be some troubleshoot, so you should have certain valves, control valves, feedback controller, feed forward controller, all these things uh, you should be there in the system which is usually these are already controlled automatically in a plant. So, you have big, big companies which actually supply this uh, control, control systems and uh, where you have used the concepts of mathematics. Now, the mathematics will come into the picture. We will talk about process control, this mathematics also goes into here. So, process control is what you do and uh, you place out various uh, unit operations or you combine them together and work out which is the best for you. So, now if I want to draw it pictorially, what does that mean? 
So this is the level of integration. So it means that in the x-axis, this becomes tougher. Not tougher, I would say. It would become more and more uh, operations you have to see. So you have to consider uh, each one is dependent on the previous one. So physical transfer phenomena will depend on thermodynamics. Kinetic catalysis will depend upon both of these. All these particle in turn depends upon particle interfacial technology depends on kinetic catalysis thermodynamics and the least is the operations which depends on all of them process control then uh, the design technology reactor concepts like that okay so now uh, the y axis gives the the idea how big the system is so this is independent thermodynamics is independent so you can uh, you have been studying thermodynamics so independent means what? You take a closed system or open system. You apply first law or second law of thermodynamics. You find out what is the relation between heat and work that you have done already. And you then find out, it uh, doesn't matter how many moles or molecules you have. If you have number of moles, you do a derivative, you get certain properties like activity coefficient. So this is uh, independent, means that the level of integration is not much required. Those are basic principles. Now then physical and transport phenomena, uh, maybe micro nano scale, that may be how the particles are transported. Let's say for example, there is heat transfer. So if the heat transfer is happening, how is the heat getting transferred? Is it through conduction, convection, radiation, something like that. Then kinetics and catalysis. So kinetics and catalysis means uh, you say uh, kinetics means whether it is fast or slow, whether the reaction volume is changing, if you have a reaction A plus B equal to C, whether the volume is changing, is it decreasing or is it increasing, all these things you have to factor in while you design the entire process. Interfacial technology comes to the picture in the mesoscale region, it means that interfacial technology means you have suppose extraction, you have a two phases. So at the interface, what is happening? So basically any solute particle will go from the, let's say if you want to extract a solute, so it will go from a, some phase to the solvent rich phase. So it is diffusing through the interface. So the interfacial properties are very important such as surface tension, mainly interfacial tension. So you need to have such, choose such phases which has low interfacial tension between the two of the phases. So that is called interfacial tension. Then you have reactor concepts and unit operation, that's then the same thing, again I'm repeating the reactor concepts means you have to design the reactors, whether it is a batch, plug flow, CSTR, how you want to connect them, do you connect a smaller with the bigger one and if it's a plug flow reactor, do you connect them a series of reactor in a series manner or in a parallel manner, all this comes under the reactor concepts and unit operation. Then finally process control, same thing, it comes under macro scale. So this is where we can measure certain properties. Then finally operations. Operation means size of the plant, how big you want to get a plant. So that will again depend upon what yield you want and what is the output capacity. So many of the plants, whether it is a refinery or a thermal plant, so how much volume of raw feed or what is the output of the final product? you intend to produce. That is while operations come into the picture. So now you see, um, if I want to describe it, so this is a, for example, this is, we start from here. So this is the reaction we are concerning. These are the two examples I have set in here. It is uh, basically, uh, you know, this is the hydro processing reaction in a refinery. So what, why are these reactions carried out? Because, you know, in crude oil, we have the light naphtha, the middle naphtha, heavier naphtha. So in the light or middle naphtha, what you do is you need to convert all the heteroatoms. This heteroatom is present in the crude oil. So you have to convert them or you have to remove them. Then only you can go ahead and separate this by some solvent extraction. The first step is your catalytic. So these are all in catalyst. I have not written the catalyst name here. So these are some different catalytic processes. The purpose of both this reaction is to make it add the hydrogen here and to remove uh, the, you try to make it, you know, this, you, it may be this type of reactions where you remove this or it may be this type of reactions where you actually convert to a straight chain compound. So these are the different, uh, you know, these processes which are called hydroprocessing reaction and for this hydroprocessing reaction you need a reactor. So this is a reactor and if this is a reactor, 
what is the catalyst inside. So you, then you come into the mesoscale, the particles, then you design the reactor, then the reactor selection, design. So when you have the feed, suppose here it is hydrogen and there it is, this is benzothiophene and this is thiophene. They are very difficult to convert because these are aromatic compounds. So the, if you, uh, you cannot simply, you know, extract it just like that. You have to do some catalytic hydrogenation. So this catalytic hydrogenation is considered in these reactors and so these are the two feed stream, in lit feed stream, some reaction or some occurs and then you get the final product. So once you know, so this is your basic, this is the micro nano, you decide upon the catalyst, the what is the intermediate, although I have written an entire reaction, there are lots of intermediate which is not shown here, the reaction mechanism. Based on this, you select reactor and after that reactor, then you put this reactor here, this is the reactor. So this is the reactor, okay. And uh, you know, you need to recycle the feed and you need to re again reinsert the product for better extraction. Then you separate out these two compounds, for example, halogen sulfide and uh, you have pentane here. You separate out, how do you want to separate these out, all these things you are getting here. So this is the separation path and this is a separation of, let us say if a separation of H2S here and separation of uh, pentane here, like that uh, there is, these are different steps. So I have not, uh, this is just a sample diagram, it does not pertain to this particular hydroprocessing reaction, it is much more complex but it is a part of refinery. So then you actually place this reactor once you have selected and then you do the remaining calculations means how are you going to put it how are you going to actually integrate it within the entire setup. So if I talk about the space and time scale, so what is the space and time scale? So you have the length scale in the y axis and the time scale in the x axis. So plant size, uh, this plant size is something like, uh, I mean it is not that 10 to the power of 3 meters means 1 kilometer. So it is an order of 1 kilometer, this is the plant size and reactor uh, is not much, I mean it will be less than 1000 meters, something like that, height of the reactor, all those things are here, somewhere here and you length means you go up and up and up, you would think of the earth, like it is a huge place, the earth. So if you want to say, if you want to say that this is the earth and we are doing something in the industry. So earth may be something, maybe the reactor and earth may be what happens, what are the effluent gases which comes out in the earth, in the atmosphere. So those are some types of thing that you want to evaluate. So this is the length scale is based on this, this is the entire earth if I am talking about. Then if you go to the x axis, you keep on changing the length scale, see it is 10 to the power of minus 15, it is in, this is the time scale, this is the length scale. So uh, particles, then molecular vibrations, let us say in molecular vibration you understand these terms, infrared spectroscopy then, and magnetic resonance, nuclear magnetic NMR spectroscopy, spectroscopic methods in general, all this depends upon these molecular vibrations and UV spectroscopy, all this comes out here. Then what are the length scale, you drop particle drop, you can usually one millimeter something like that, you can measure, crystal molecule goes further down, then atom we talk about nanometer, then electron is much more lower than that. So these are all on the domain of physics and crystals chemistry. So more or less these crystal molecules, atoms, electron are the domain of physics and chemistry together but we also engineers are now chipping in because as you know the research is becoming increasingly interdisciplinary. So then you go ahead and do the chemical reaction, what is how much time does the chemical reaction takes? So this is let us say for 1 second, 1000 second, 10 to the power of 6 seconds, 10 to the power of 9, 12. So when you go to this side chemical reactions more and more to this side, so what is happening? Let us say fossil fuel, how is the fossil fuel form? It is a reaction only but it is a very slow reaction, so millions of years. So millions of years means you are going towards this area, oil, oil formation, coal formation, you are going to millions of years towards this side. So we are also, uh, we are, but we in our, uh, mainly in our plants or when you talk of reactions, usually do in this chemical reactions, try to optimize the system, try to optimize the catalyst do uh, some thorough studies regarding the selectivity of the catalyst, whether I should use a heterogeneous catalyst or a homogeneous catalyst, you take or make the choice and move ahead. So for example, I just now I was telling the petroleum, how much time does the petroleum, because we are 
it's talking about a new term nowadays which is called process intensification. What does process intensification signify? It means a large number of commercially attractive catalytic reactions if you have we know that this encountered reactivity is within a rather narrow range. So, the reaction rates that are relevant in practice are rarely less than 1. So, rate of the reaction is an uh, important property. Reaction should occur in a reasonable amount of space time and a reasonably sized reactor. So, we should see what is the physical and economic constraint. For example, in this figure, if you see the petroleum takes the reactivity means how many moles of the reactants get converted. So, it is very less, very, very slow. So, that is why you take millions of years to form petrol or coal. If you go to biochemical, it is fast as fast as compared to petroleum, but still it is very slow. But when you go with this industrial catalysis with the so wide variety and domain of the industrial catalyst, this industrial catalyst nowadays there is a huge you know this is uh, a technology or huge uh, different catalysts which are coming out some based on zeolites uh, some some based on which actually enhance this rate so our aim is to go this this side so that's why in this particular uh, course a module is two modules in fact are devoted to the industrial catalysis where we will see the heterogeneous and homogeneous catalysis separately the aim of both these catalysis is to increase this number this one go to higher and higher Okay. So, what is this process intensification signify? It means it is significant reduction in the size of the chemical plants. We do not want a big chemical plant. If we want to make a small chemical plant and get the same output, why not? We can try that out. So, that is called process intensification. For example, how is the way to do a process intensification? How do I shrink the size? One way is reactor volume. If you want to lower or even to decrease the reactor volume, we have to select catalyst with increased activity. Increased activity again based on more active sites and more active sites information can be obtained from what which one from the nano level that is when we talk about the physics and chemistry. Okay. Then selectivity. So, if it is more selective, it only picks up or converts those compounds which are desirable, which is easy. So, the separation is easier. So, that the reaction is taken care of, then we have only need to worry about the mass and heat transfer. Then we will find out equipment which will enable faster rates of mass and heat transfer because the products are formed on the catalyst, then it is diffused through in the bulk and then separate out. So, then the diffusion process that is the mass transfer, heat is conducting, the heat transfer takes place. So, that is what we have to have equipment that enables faster rates for mass and heat transfer. The heat exchangers that are compact and allow for a high. So, nowadays we have heat exchangers that is compact and allow for heat, high heat transfer rates on a volume basis. Nowadays we have this monolithic reactors and micro reactors which are examples of novel reactors. So, what are monolithic reactors? I will tell you it is something like it is based on some ceramic material. So, this is suppose a monolithic reactor, you have this reactor part of it, there are many pores inside one of them I formed. So, if you magnify them, what you do after this, once you get this as a raw material, is called a wash coating, wash coating of the entire monolithic substrate. So, a monolith means a single piece. From a single piece, can you make a catalyst working? Yes, you can make, you dip it in a dispersed phase. So, catalyst size, something like this will happen. So, I am just magnifying this. When I am magnifying it, so the these sides will get washed with the catalyst or the dispersed phase. So, these are all dispersed phase. So, once this dispersed phase set in inside this block, okay, so then uh, you can have the reaction happening inside this active side. Then um, if you further magnify this, this will look something like this, the entire catalyst structure. So, you will have catalyst sites present everywhere. Okay you are magnifying this entire, so I am magnifying this area. Okay. If I am magnifying this area, it looks like something like this. So, these are your active sites. So, this is the new invention or we can call disruptive technology. So, you use monolithic reactors. Then there is micro reactor. What does micro reactor means? For example, micro reactor means we are doing some reaction 
where the length scale is around millimeter. Why it is used? Why are we using micro reactors if the normal reactor can do the purpose? See, micro reactors are something which can be used only on certain conditions because the flow will be constricted. It will be of a low Reynolds number, the laminar in, uh, region. So, what are those reactions? For example, it will have a high surface to volume ratio. So, if it has a high surface to volume ratio, so it means that uh, which are reactions which are very fast, let us say those which are less than one second fast reactions, it will help us to enable good mixing and then it will also enable good heat transfer in such reactions. Or you have rapid form of reactions, the time scale let us say it is between uh, 10 seconds to let us say 20 minutes something like that, that also can be useful. So, it can be let us say you have to control the kinetically reactions, you can control it kinetically. Okay. Or if the reaction which are very slow, that is which is taking more than 10 minutes, so which are greater than 10 minutes than micro reactors, it will be very useful in this case that it will help us in the safety. So, some reactions you need to monitor for the safety aspect. In those cases, you can choose, not all cases you will use micro reactors. So, micro reactor is something like this, you have components, let us say A and B, you are going here. These are some of the channels which you make and finally you get the products. So, let us say A plus B reacts in this micro reactor setup, this micro reactors of the order of 1 millimeter. So, they will mix together whether it is fast reaction, intermediate reaction or very slow reaction, we will make the choice based on the reaction kinetics. So, these are those things. So, like monolithic multiphase reactors enables very high rates and selectivities. So, that is the reason the process identification is nowadays very important. So, this is the overall structure of a chemical process. You would require raw material, you do a physical treatment. Physical treatment means uh, you make it ready for further step, further conversion. Then only because if you just suppose you have biomass and you want to convert it to ethanol, so you won't use a biomass directly. You will, what you will do, you will crush them huh, into small pieces so that the area becomes larger or you do a pretreatment, remove the undesired uh, particle, the silica particles, those are those physical treatment. Then you do a reaction of those reactor, let like us say in the case of biomass, you add acid to it. What happens in the acid is there, cellulose will come up, I mean cellulose will be removed and like that. Those are those reactions. Then again you use a physical treatment to separate out the products. So, this is the overall chemical process structure we call. So, you consist of a physical treatment, then some, some let us say in this case I am talking about reactions then physical treatment again separate out the products. So, a chemical process unit feed must be processed via series of physical treatment methods. For example, if I talking about coal, coal must be crushed or if I talking about liquid feedstock pretreatment maybe it need to be evaporated or if I am talking about benzene because benzene is mostly associated with water, then uh, water needs to be removed because benzene can be converted to ethyl benzene and ethyl benzene you know it is a very important precursor for the manufacture of styrene. Styrene consumes a lot of chemicals in the petra in, in our uh, you know in the polymer market you make polystyrene used in our day to day affairs. So, that is why ethyl benzene is an important raw material. So, chemical reaction must be used to eliminate impurities in the feed, for example, desulphurization of the naphtha feed. So, desulphurization means remove the sulphur component, make it a straight chain compound. Or raw syngas for ammonia conversion. What do you mean by raw syngas? Syngas is actually a mixture of carbon monoxide, hydrogen, primarily these two syngas. So, this hydrogen uh, since it is a huge uh, rich source of syngas and how, where do you get the syngas from? From coal. If you do the steam reforming of coal, if you react the coal with steam, you will get the mixture of carbon monoxide, hydrogen and some amount of methane also. So, this then this hydrogen is a very useful raw material for ammonia synthesis. So, separation and purification of reaction products are required after the chemical conversion. So, you react two materials, you separate them out, it should be separable, it should not be not separate even if you have the reaction complete. While distillation is the most prevalent form of separation, other methods such as extraction, the crystallization, membrane separation may also be utilized. So, you should as a student you should ask these questions which are very important. So, what are the reactions involved? 
what are the reactions involved? Whether the volume decreases or increases, whether the enthalpy is exothermic or endothermic, the th reaction thermodynamics, whether it is thermodynamically controlled or the reaction kinetically controlled, what are the kinetics and the optimal condition that is space time reactor volume, whether you want to adopt a heterogeneous or homogeneous catalyst system, both have their inherent you know the heterogeneous and homogeneous have their different uh, use, stability, how many times I can use the catalyst, how many times it can go 50,000 cycles, 1 lakh cycles, more the stability better it is ok. So, this is very important. Then effects on the process design, so how will it affect the process design that is also important because uh, uh, while you do that effects on process design you consider all these effects the if you have heat getting if it is exothermic reaction you need to take care of the heat how to reduce the quantity of heat. is it possible to reduce the activation so for example like desulfurization or denitrification reactions do poison the catalyst so how can i make a new catalyst so that it does not de deactivate the catalyst then uh, regeneration can i use the catalyst for example here again or can i use the solvent again because solvent sometimes if you are doing for extraction for example in aromatic extraction unit so the solvent is kept on passing from the hybrid mechanism that is from extractor to a separator then again extractor separator like that you can do it for a limited number of times after that there will be oligomers of solvent because it is going uh, repeated cycle of heating and and cooling heating cooling that actually reduces or the thermal stability of the solvent decreases. You have to think that regeneration is required and you have to work in that direction. So, what stages are involved besides the catalyst? For example, if you conduct the reaction, what are the stages? Do you want to separate out them? If you separate out, how do you separate out? Then after if you have separated out, then you have to consider the heat mass and heat transfer limitations is a liquid or gas recycling required because sometimes uh, you need to send uh, the liquid again into the column for example distillation column when you do reflux you de need to add the liquid once again into the column for better mass transfer so you have to apply your concepts and see whether you have to do that or not is feed purification needed so if feed sometimes you require in a pure phase then you have to check whether I have to remove all other components and keep only the desired raw material inside and then insert it into a reactor or a extractor. Then the environment impact assessment likewise nowadays as you must be knowing that all the governments has put strict legislation on the PPM levels of nitrogen, sulphur, carbon, carbon monoxide all these things. So, you must be aware of our uh, this terms like air quality index AQI. So, this air quality index what is it? It is then nothing nothing but this only here it gives us the presence of the uh, this NOx, SOx all these things. So, like uh, this have a value like you see in your daily television you see that uh, you report uh, the AQI index. So, around 100 to 80 it is considered to be good less than 100 to 80 higher than that it means you have these pollutant in the atmosphere. So, that is why there are strict legislation if you want to start any industry or any most to any new plant you must do this type of assessment before you start. Then these are another pertinent question safety issues, safety issues is important because you have seen there are a lot of industrial disasters, nuclear disasters, then Bhopal gas tragedy you are well aware of this methyl isocyanate gas evaporated because of the malfunctioning of the reactor. So, those safety issues you should uh, consider. Is it possible to incorporate many functions into a single piece of equipment? For example, I am talking about let us say reactive distillation. So, you have a reaction as well as distillation occurring together, these are called many functions into one equipment. What is the economics? What is the cost of these processes? That is so important you have to ask. You have to ask whether when you are preparing the conceptual flow sheet, what is the cost of this process? Am I using too expensive or am I, are our hot and cold utilities pretty high? Can the technology sustainability be increased? So, can it be sustainable? Sustainable means uh, like you are using some raw materials from other source. So, it means that those sources which are already not used, you are using it in your uh, particular process. So, it is sustainable. So, no, nothing is 
liberating out from the entire ecosystem. So, it is sustainable means the plant is running, it is sustaining on it itself. So, now we come, uh, we just discuss shortly about the module contents. So, uh, the modules inorganic chemical industries 1 and 2 is basically the base chemical, we call this as the base chemical, sulfuric acid, inorganic base chemical. Why inorganic base chemicals? These are used for number of further chem precursor for further chemicals. Sulfuric acid, you know there are the uses of this sulfuric acid as a catalyst. Uh, it, it is used for many processes. Then uh, sulfur production, this is important. The sulfuric acid, we will see the methods such as the uh, initial earlier method, the lead process, then the newer version, then the contact process. But all these processes, I like to point out, we will see the modern outlook. So, whatever you have read is fine, but the modern, how are they going about for the sulfuric acid plant or a sulfur plant, we will see those. We will see the thermodynamics of the ammonia synthesis. Ammonia is again of some compound which is very useful because nowadays the liquid ammonia is now government is putting lot of effort as a, you know, a source of hydrogen because we are moving towards the hydrogen based economy. So, liquid ammonia is one of the potential fuel for liquid ammonia. So, the synthesis needs to be known along with it the thermodynamics. Then we discuss about the integrated ammonia plant and the urea which is the most important fertilizer which is used by our uh, agricultural community. So, we also see the syngas production from the natural gas. So, this is also an important aspect, the syngas production from natural gas is useful because from the natural gas or coal you can either do a steam reforming or you can use the combustion reaction. So, steam reforming is like endothermic and combustion is like exothermic, you can uh, convert them to syngas and syngas as you know has number of applications. So, that we will see and then we will see the coal gasification. The coal gasification will include the coal gasification reactions and also include the coal gasifier technology. We will see the gasifiers in details and also we will discuss the integrated gas cycle. Then uh, the nitric acid, another inorganic chemical which is very important, nitric acid, nitric acid we can use for many other precursors. Then we will also see the NOx abatement because NOx is one of the primary product coming out from the nitric acid. So, it has to be reduced. So, we will see some catalytic, selective catalytic reducer SCR, then phosphoric acid, then the chlorine production because chlorine production uh, can be happening in three ways. One is uh, the chlorine uh, which we get from the diaphragm cell, then the membrane cell and then the mercury cell, all these methods we will be studying. Then soda ash, caustic soda, you know these are very important for the detergents, making detergents, making uh, for uh, this for fertilizers, all these things are very useful, soda ash, solvase process we will see. Then the next two modules are very important. This particular module is actually nothing but the heterogeneous catalysis. Heterogeneous catalysis means catalyst in the solid form. Okay. In the heterogeneous catalysis, what is it which is we are why are we using heterogeneous catalysis? So, for that we have to see what is the difference between heterogeneous and homogeneous. We will discuss them, but primarily what it is, it is solid, solid material, fine. So, solid means it is not dispersed in a liquid. So, it means that uh, when a catalyst is dispersed, it is a single phase, all the active sites are in contact with the solution, but in the heterogeneous reaction, not all the sites in contact. So, reaction rates will be particularly higher in the case of homogeneous catalysis. But then why are we not using homogeneous catalysis? The reason is very simple, we are, we can do many reactions with homogeneous catalysis because you know you can have access to all the active sites, but the problem comes in the separation. Separation is not at all easy. Separation is easy only in those cases, we have to use homogeneous catalyst in those cases only when the molecular weight of the catalyst and the products or reactants, especially the molecular weight of the special, they should be, I mean the, they should vary in magnitude and the products and reactants molecular weight should be small enough, that is we have to take. So, those examples are given here. 
isobutene, pentene, hexene. So, this isobutene, pentene, hexene, what are these? What are we doing? We are, uh, we are converting to isooctane, because you know that isooctane is useful for making, uh, you know, this increasing the octane number, or we are making them into isoparaffins, so pentane, hexane to isoparaffin, and then ethyl benzene we are making to styrene. So, the production of styrene will be taken up in this production of ethene oxide. Now, ethene oxide is a very important compound because you have this uh, something like this structure uh, to the ethene oxide uh, is useful because it can immediately you can add the oxygen atom and so you can use it in several processes which uh, we will see in due course of time. Then the monolith reactors based on the monolithic catalysis which are very useful because understand please understand one thing you are having some in the car for example, you have the heart of the process which is the engine where the combustion occurs. Then there is another part which is the exhaust. In the exhaust the flow of gases is less. So, when you have a less flow of gases then there it is this use is magnified monolith reactors. Okay. Not everywhere you can use all of them. So, you have certain applications, certain part which you can apply. Continuing with the industrial catalysis for continuing process. We will also study the methanol and formaldehyde process proceed. Okay. So, the methanol as you know this methanol and formaldehyde are one of the key base chemical. So, methanol if I want to write down what not it can be used, it can be used for let us say if I want to write down here methanol can be used as a precursor for the production of in fact formaldehyde because that is one again we have written. And then what it can also be used for production of let us say acetic acid, esters, all these things. I need not, I need to need not discuss, we will be all be taking these issues while we discuss the homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis. And then uh, it can be also be used for the production of let us say some uh, precursor monomers, for example, like methyl methacrylate, MMA, methyl methacrylate or you may have DMT, dimethyl terephthalate, dimethyl terephthalate, these are the monomers. So, MMA can be used for making PMMA polymer PMMA, while DMT can be used for making the polymer PET. So, it is something like DMT if it is condensed with ethylene glycol it becomes PET and there are other you can also provide make amines. So, that is why this uh, methanol uh, study is very important. So, as the formaldehyde and formaldehyde you know they are made by combination of partial oxidation and dehydrogenation from methanol. This is one of the chemical which is used in paints and varnishes. Then we will see the fuel additives, the ethyl terbutyl ether and methyl terbutyl ether. ETB and MTB they are usually made from methanol with isobutene. So, methanol again is the precursor. So, what are these? They will increase the octane rating. So, this is a branch compound like a ether. So, it will the octane rating of the fuel. Okay. Then we come to the homogeneous, what is the homogeneous uh, the catalysis? So, it is mainly used as transition metal catalyst for example, like acetic acid production or hydroformylation. What is hydroformylation? It is similar like hydroprocessing, it is adding of hydrogen basically to propene. So, primarily the use of these two both of is to make aldehydes. higher level aldehydes. So, acetic acid production, hydroformylation of propene, hydroformylation of all are used by using they use the homogeneous catalysis. So, homogeneous catalysis and heterogeneous catalysis we will see this because most of the industrial industries use these type of catalysis. So, for example, this a new disruptive technology what they have made is the shop process shell Shell has devised this process, it is shell higher olefin process, shop. What does this? It will convert, let us say we have this ethene molecule, right. The ethene molecule it will convert in this manner. So, when you have the ethene molecule here, so it is a process where you have let us say uh, n plus 2 moles of ethene molecules gets converted into a product which is something like this n. Now, this n can be different. If this n is C4 to C8, it can be used as a for uh, polyethylene, polyethylene or plasticizer manufacturing. If it is C6 to C10, 
then it will become a plasticizer okay and if it is c11 c18 then it will become two detergent grade alcohol detergent grade alcohol detergent grade alcohol how does this happen is happened by homogeneous catalysis so they have made a nickel carbonyl type of catalyst which actually does this and it can vary this n so based on this different n values so this ethene oxide uh, earlier we seen the ethene oxide now this is ethene oligomer oligomer means they have made a catalyst in such a manner that it does not become a polymer otherwise we will be a problem so they made it so that it becomes a oligomer so this is a difference oligomer and polymer oligomer so oligomer is having short chains so c18 so they have they can tune the process condition and the catalyst such a manner you produce 3 4 2 8 6 to 10 or 11 to 18 so this is very important we will uh, take up in the ensuing modules the production of bulk chemicals we will also see the dimethyl terephthalate and the terephthalic acid so the dimethyl terephthalate and terephthalate acid if i want to write here dmt and tpa this if i want to condense with ethylene glycol this will form PET very important compound so PET you must be aware this is the compound which we usually the polymer which we form for the bottles plastic bottles so its use needs to be studied so that will be one of the our topic of subject of interest in the production of bulk chemicals then final it comes the module name the sustainable biorefinery so we will design the biorefinery products as you know this biorefinery is very important because in the context uh, what do you want to do with the biomass uh, there are many ways you can play out with this biomass so one of this is i'm just showing you what are the different ways you can do it let's say you have this biomass so you can either heat it get as a fuel you can use but this is not useful we don't want to use it just for fuel because it have lot of pollution in the air uh, what you can do you can combust it or one one of the uses you do a extraction you get terpenes these are used for making compounds some intermediate compounds so from there you can get value added products terpenes or you do a hydrolysis You do a hydrolysis, you can form sugar and do a fermentation, you get alcohol. So you are getting a, again a potential fuel, alcohol as well as a raw material. Or you do a pyrolysis, pyrolysis if you do, you will get bio oil, bio oil and this bio oil can be treated to get liquid fuels. Okay. Or you can do direct fermentation of biomass, direct fermentation. If you do a direct fermentation, you will get ethanol, butanol like that, ethanol, butanol like that, higher alcohols. Okay. So this is a way or you can directly do a combustion that is also, you do a combustion, biomass combustion, you can produce syngas because you do a gasification you do a gasification you get syngas and syngas is a rich source of raw material one of the raw material for pre preparing um, let us say one of the important compound as a base chemical we call it is methanol so you see this biomass has so many uses so this we will take up in this biorefinery products process design how to optimally synthesize this type of refineries the feedstock, what type of feedstock means biomass, whether you with food waste, municipal waste, agricultural waste, double, all this. Then before the biomass is put into a, an important process is to separate out the cellulose because if you separate out the cellulose part, the cellulose part has high sugar content. So you can easily convert it to sugar with the appropriate enzymes. But the separation is not easier as you know it consists of cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin. So they are tightly attached with lignin. So then we have to use some process. We use an acid process or a base, you add acid base like that to take out the cellulose in the liquid form. Continuing with the sustainable biorefinery, we will actually 
also conclude our module by discussing about the biofuels and as well as biochemicals. So, biofuels means fuels which we obtain from the biomass, what are those ethanol. So, you also have heard 1G, 2G, just now I have discussed. So, these are the fuels. So, biofuels you can say ethanol or maybe butanol, all these are biofuels, okay. And uh, then biochemicals. Biochemicals are similar to what the we do in the oil refinery, you get chemicals. Similarly, you will get in a biorefinery biochemicals. So, biochemicals, for example, you must have heard these terms. This is 5 HMF hexamethylfural. Then you have levulinic acid, levulinic acid. These are some compounds. Then, uh, I mean, you have also have glycerol, okay. Then you will have uh, another compound which is very useful that is FDCA, furine dicarboxylic acid. Now, this FDCA is one of the platform chemicals declared by DOE. I mean, all others are platform chemicals, but this is very emerging because this FDCA is similar to like DMT or TPT, that is the dimethyl terephthalate or terephthalic acid, because if it is reacted with ethylene glycol, it will give poly ethylene furanoid. This PEF is having a similar character and structure like PET. So, this FDCA is one of the major chemical people are doing undergoing research because the components is bio based and they can be used for making a polymer which is similar like PET, but it is PEF, but biodegradable that is the most important advantage. So, we will all discuss this in the ensuing modules and the lectures. So, I will stop here. So, these are the references which you can actually refer. So, this is the textbook which I am following, uh, Molin's book, where uh, you can get access to all the um, future flow sheets which I will be discussing. Thank you. Mm -hmm.